Hi. Welcome back to another episode of Chamber Talk, a podcast brought to you by Aberdeen and Grampian Chamber of Commerce. I'm your host, Finlay Jack, today joined by a psychiatrist, a TV doctor, and a three times TEDx speaker, Dr. Taraka Gunaradne. I hope I've not butchered that too much, or better known simply as Dr. T. Thank you for joining me. Um, now, you cover a broad range of subjects as a psychiatrist. If anyone mm-hmm. was at the Ultimate Masterclass Festival with Davina McCall, we heard you talk about perimenopausal brain fog mm-hmm. and how you improved, essentially, more than a thousand people's memories in the music hall that night. That was a fun night. Yeah, it was fun, wasn't it? And today, I want to talk to you about you, though, because within a couple of years, you've went from NHS Grampian, you were a consultant there, to appearing on Big Brother Later Live and a number of other TV shows as well. Where did mm. the journey for you begin? How did you how did you get there? Mm. By accident, I think is the <laughs> short answer. <laughs> Go on and expand on that. Tell yeah. us how. Some of these things you plan and some of these things you kind of have to colour in as you go along. And I think maybe for me it was a bit of a mix, Finley. But the short story is that as I was working as a doctor, a big part of that is education of other medical students and other doctors. And so I was doing that month in month. I loved it. Absolutely loved it. It was always important to me to communicate in a way that I would have got it. I don't know about you, but when I was in uni, I just couldn't pay attention to what they were telling me in the (laughs) lectures. And I was like, oh, if only they could just communicate this in a way that I could understand. So that was really what I wanted to do for others. And so I got a lot of on the ground practice doing that. I I landed a TED talk after I became a consultant psychiatrist in 2016. And then that opened the door to the world outside of Mm -hmm. traditional medicine because it goes on YouTube and then, you know, uh, companies start to get in touch. And then during the pandemic, I uh, had the offer to take part in my very first big TV show, which was with Sandy Toxvig, who is an amazing woman. Yeah. And that was actually called, uh, uh, Can I Improve My Memory? And I had the role of being a coach to some famous British faces, helping them build their memory to a superhuman level. And um, it was through living a double life at that time when I was doing television and traditional medicine where I thought that now could be the time to risk taking the jump. And that's what I did. And the rest is history in the making. And let's talk about that risk because it wasn't a normal risk. It was during <laughs> a global pandemic, you decided to to leave a, a pretty safe and secure job You're right. in the NHS to, to go out on your own. I mean, that's a, that's a ballsy move. That. You're right. I think there are a couple of interlocking vectors that led to me being able to do something like that and at the time i said that i'm going to build the plane as i fly it and i think i still say that finley i'm building the plane as i fly it but in the pandemic it was a big shake-up for many people globally because the uncertainty was enforced upon us we didn't really know what was happening next we didn't know how to plan and the disruption for many people got them to introspect and think about hey what do i care about in life what are my values Uh, what matters to me what motivates and fascinates me and i think that with the enforced uncertainty the thought of taking a leap maybe felt less scary yeah but i think the other interlocking vector is that there was just passion like i would love to be able to reach as many people as i can in an hour in a clinic i reach one person per hour but maybe through a live keynote it's thousands and if it's through television it's millions and so the 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 idea of scaling up uh was really appealing so i think there is a a mix of enforced uncertainty and disruption and also passion you mentioned that just previously being at university learning about these things and often these big long words these medical words that go over 99 (laughs) percent of our heads i i was at the music hall when you presented before davina and i I really enjoyed how for a lack of a better term you you dumbed it down in many ways for the audience right was that a big part in you going i guess solo trying to get people to understand many of these i guess misconceptions certainly around perimenopausal brain fog was one of those misconceptions that we didn't quite understand yes how it affects the brain yes yes I, absolutely. And I feel like the, you know, the greatest distance between people is misunderstanding. So if you can close the misunderstanding gap by making something that's very complex, very simple, then people could do something with that. And that's really what I want for people. It's not just information, it's transformation. When I want to give someone something that's 
factual, that's insightful, that then they can apply and then have a better life, right? So when you say dumbed it down, I think you're right. I think that, you know, we can talk about neuroscience in a complicated way, or I could talk about <laughs> yeah. the hippocampus in your brain and how that's like hippos in a university campus, <laughs> memorizing stuff, yeah. right? And so when people get that, then they can do something with it. And that's, that's the goal. Mm. Talk to me, you mentioned how you kind of got your first break with uh, yeah. Sally Talks, like, how does a guy from Balmedy go on to work on the BBC ITV <laughs> Channel 4? It must be a hell of a lot of hard work as well as, as breaks like that with Sally How do you know I live in Balmedy? <laughs> <laughs> You're a journalist. I, I, I researched everything. <laughs> uh, Balmedy Shire. I live in Balmedy Shire in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in that zone. Uh, so the factual answer is I did my second, I've done three TED Talks. Mm -hmm. My second TED Talk was on memory. Okay. And um, I was headhunted by television as a memory coach for celebrities. Yeah. And interestingly, this is interesting. I, uh, I I don't think I've really shared this publicly, but the 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 offer for the program came from another another source a couple of years beforehand, and it went nowhere. I I uh, I was door knocked through email. Hey, we're thinking of doing a show uh -huh. training celebrities in their memory. Would you be interested? And it. Uh, I said yes, but it didn't really go anywhere. And then a couple of years later, maybe 18 months later, it, the, the offer came back and I felt like I was already primed. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I was already sort of thought about it. And uh, so I jumped on a video call and met with some researchers who wanted to ask me about, hey, why do you know about this? And how do you tie this in? And, and the answer is that when I was a kid, I, I, I trained in this stuff <laughs> to help me with exams. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, you jump on a video call and then, you know, they go, wow, we're interested, fly down to London, have another conversation with producers. All of this was new to me. Finley had no idea what I was doing. Didn't have an agent at the time. Didn't know anyone mm -hmm. in entertainment at the time. So I was just, uh, building the plane as I fly it. So you got that kind of first offer, so to speak. Yeah. 18 months you had to wait. What was that waiting period? Like, were you thinking about kind of leaving that, that full-time job with NHS Grampian to <laughs> go into this TV speaking thing. What, what was that 18 months like, kind of not hearing anything and then bang, you're on TV? Yeah, yeah. And I should say, in the meantime, I was doing live on stage okay. speaking yeah. in the corporate sector for businesses, helping them with uh, mindset, therefore action and outcome or profit. We'll talk about more that more on that later. Uh, but I was doing a lot of live psychological education that's practically applicable for people's lives and uh, mainly in the workplace so and by the way that was happening in my time outside of my more than full-time job in the, in the so hospital. you were still working when you were i was doing more than 40 hours a week as a yeah, as, as doctor as a doctor do, yeah i better get up early and go to um business breakfasts and speak wow. there and I, I did a, you know, as many speakers have to do, you speak for free for ages. And I'd be getting yeah. up and I'd be speaking at evening events. I'd be speaking at the weekends. And, uh, you know, so those wheels were already in motion. So those 18 months, you know, weren't with no activity. Yeah. But uh, after the TV show, you know, Finley, I loved being on set. Like, have you been on set? Have you been on set of a television program no, yourself? No, no, no. I just love. I've, I've got a face for radio. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only joking. I haven't. No, I haven't been on a TV. Dude, set. you know that we are filming this podcast. <laughs> I know. Most of us are on Spotify. It's all right. <laughs> uh, I'm speaking to an extremely handsome chap. For those of you that are listening in, so um, I can I can vouch for Finley right there. <laughs> um, hey, like, yeah, I loved. I loved what goes on behind the scenes and the teams of people that had to pull together to make what you see on television work. You, you know, we have to do like a hundred hours of filming for just one episode to, to, to pull together. And so I love that whole like story and mystery and the teamwork behind. And I felt like there's, there's so much I can learn from media and take into the corporate world as well. But yeah, I just felt like I was living a double life at the time, Finley, like doing television, doing a clinic. Yeah. And, you, you know, the such world black, is like, such a black and white thing, isn't well, it? Kind of. You say it to then talking to somebody about, about the brain. Yeah, because and I, Forrester Hill. I yeah. might be, I, I, just, I was in the law library in London training celebrities to improve their memory. And the very next day, I'd be in the clinic in Aberdeen <laughs> doing a consultation and treatment on depression. Yeah. So I, it was like two different worlds right next to each other. 
in a in a world that was very crazy and uncertain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You seem judging just purely by your energy, so passionate about this line of work. It seems uh -huh. to be have you always been this kind of ball of energy, this positive up <laughs> has that always been the case? Because it's yeah, it's wonderful. Thank you for saying that. I appreciate that. And I like that you say that because um uh the the, the energy that I have, I think, is a reflection of operating out of passion. Uh, you often hear people say, you've got to find what you're passionate about in order to go pursue that. And there's brain science behind that. When you are cognizant of what you're passionate about, I mean, let me back up a little bit. When you're at work, work gets busy and all you can think about is the next box to check off, yeah, the next yeah. task, the next email to clear, all that kind of stuff. And that uses certain types of thinking certain brainwave activity in the brain and also certain regions of the brain if you are cognizant of what motivates and fascinates you why you do what you do what you love what you're passionate about it lights up certain areas of your brain that improve goal attainment probability mm -hmm. meaning that if i'm powered by passion the chances of me achieving the goals that i set and this applies not just for individuals but for teams and organizations okay. as well it's increased. Um, and so, yeah, I um, don't even feel like I go to work anymore, really. Most of the time, I feel like it's a joy. I feel yeah. like it's... Uh, Which is what we all aim for. Aim for. Isn't it? Yeah. And um, let's let's talk about your blueprint, mind, action, profit. Just just give us a rundown on, on what that is, what the meaning behind that is. Okay. So the word profit, let's clear that up first. The word profit, when you say that word, what do you think about? Money. Money. Money is the first thing, yeah. And you're right to think that. But if you go back to the root word in Latin for profit, it comes from a word perfectus, which means progress. The word profit really just means progress. And you can profit in so many different ways. You can profit financially, you can profit in your team's culture, you can profit in your well-being, you can profit in your relationships, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So really what I'm talking about is progress, growth. Everyone says yes to growth. If I go into a room of 1,000 people or 10,000 people and say, who's interested in positive transformation in some shape or form, whether it's in sport, whether it's in your social life, at work, whatever, everyone puts their hand up, right? So. I'm talking about progress. So this blueprint that I've created really just verifies that if you want to shape progress intentionally and improve it, there's a connection with what goes on in the brain. So I go, right, okay. true or false, how you feel, in other words, what goes on in your mind influences how you take actions. It's true. Yeah. How you take actions influences the results that you get. It's true. Mm -hmm. So if we reverse engineer that, we can say that if you want to change results, you got to change behavior. If you want to change behavior, you've got to change the mind. Mind, action, outcome, or mind, action, profit. And so even for us here in Aberdeen, we would like to see the city profit. We would like to see the city's culture profit, energy profit, you know, um, uh, the love for this city, the opportunity, all that. We, we want to see profit everywhere, but it's going to come from how we think yeah and take action both together um that's the mind action profit blueprint it's the inextricable linkage of all three of these things that have an interplay that if you have a helicopter view of what's going on in your mind the actions you're taking the results you're getting and what you pay attention to because let's face it when you pay attention to the things that are going bad what does that do to our energy it drops it right it changes our action so it's it's all about that i'm glad you mentioned the city center there because there is a, an increased focus right now on really improving it really unlocking aberdeen's potential and a lot of that as we've kind of spoke about prior to this is to do with creative thinking mm -hmm. how, how do you harness creative thinking how do you enable somebody to think creatively and, and reach the potential of of, of that thinking one of my favorite subjects Finley you're reading <laughs> my mind and I'm the psychiatrist here but you're Sorry, reading no, my I'm mind I like job. this okay <laughs> look um Saint Yorgi discovered vitamin C Nobel Prize winner and he defined innovation as this I'm seeing what everyone is seeing but I'm thinking what no one else has thought yeah so what does that mean it means that the actions and outcomes that we get can be changed dependent on the ideas that we have. Where do these ideas come from? Well, the neuroscientific explanation to that is that your brain has a big part to play in that. However, what's really interesting is that our ability to generate ideas can vary dependent on how stressed we are, how much of a break we take, right. what we're doing, uh, I mean, do you get your best ideas when someone's telling you off and no. shouting at No, right. It's probably on a walk. Mm -hmm. It's probably in the shower. When you're relaxed, yeah. When you're relaxed. So if you do a head scan on someone and look at the brain 
wave activity of someone that's stressed versus someone that's relaxed. When you're in stress mode, and we're geeking out now, but let's do this a little bit, you'll see a preponderance of what we call beta wave activity. I'm focused, I'm thinking, using my memory, I'm stressed. Like maybe in a, in a, a very pressured meeting. Yeah. When we go for a walk, when we are having a shower, when we're chilling out, we'll see an increase in alpha wave activity. In fact, when you close your eyes, if you and I just close your eyes right now, we'll see on EEG an increase in alpha wave activity. What's interesting about alpha wave activities is when you're in that state, your brain is able to create more non-literal solutions to problems. Like it's easier to think of something really cartoony, like you're riding a stegosaurus into a... Um, uh, fast food driving, <laughs> right? When you close your eyes, it's easier to picture. Why? Because we get an increase in alpha wave activity and we can be more creative. If we are sitting stressed, worried about everything that's going wrong, if we're having meeting after meeting, back to back with no break, if we aren't actually opening up space for creative thinking, we aren't going to create the ideas that we need. Innovation. I'm seeing what everyone is seeing, but I'm thinking what no one else has thought. Is it difficult to, to create that alpha wave activity? We all live, most of us live busy lives that often can be stressful. Is it difficult to, to, to find that balance, draw that line uh, and be able to relax? Yeah, yeah. And part of that is uh, the hustler's fallacy, the dopamine loop drug that goes on in our mind whereby we feel like we have to take action and if we don't, we're falling behind. When in actual fact, and let's go back to a very famous book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey, one of the habits is take time out to sharpen the saw, right? And a true story, I um, uh, would go to B&Q every year to go get a real Christmas tree mm -hmm. because that's what my wife's into real, real Christmas, Christmas trees, trees yeah. and they're more expensive and they're more effort and the sap goes everywhere but that's what she likes anyway so I bring it home and then they tell you don't plant the Christmas tree they say saw off the end of the Christmas tree which really boggles my mind because someone has already sawn the tree <laughs> nonetheless you gotta saw the end off now I have one of these like uh budget saws yeah and year one saw the end off fine good had Christmas the next year buy another tree use the same saw saw off but it took a bit longer Year three, same saw, new tree, even longer. Year four, I literally had to karate chop the tree. I was beating the trunk of the tree with this yeah. blunt saw. And that's my point. My point is if we aren't disciplined enough to rest, if we aren't disciplined enough to agree with how our biology works, then we will never get those results. And so if we want to be more creative, we got to create time to be creative. Mm -hmm. You spoke in depth at the Ultimate Masterclass Festival about memory, about it increasing yes. your memory. This was, yes. this was, this was tailored to, to Perry Mary Paul's mm. brain fog, but, but I know it's, it has a much broader message yes. as well. And this is a difficult question. I'm Go sure. on. If you could give anyone a single piece of advice to improve their memory, what, what would that be? Attention is the highway to memory. A lot of our forgetfulness is not because we have a bad memory, but because we didn't pay attention to the information that landed right in front of us enough to shuffle that into our long-term memory. And so it evaporates from the inbox tree, which is our short term. And this happens all the time. When you meet someone for the first time, they tell you their name and 10 seconds later, you've forgotten that it's too late to ask them. So um, when anyone introduces themselves to you, here's my top tip as a practice, pay attention to their name, hear their name, and try and think of the first thing that comes to mind when you hear that name. So if someone said to me, hi, my name is Tom, the first thing that comes up in my mind is Tom Cruise. And I'm just now imagining this guy flying um, a Tomcat. Yeah. Okay. And that's an image now that is difficult to release from my mind. And I'm more likely to remember that guy. So look, attention is a highway to memory. Pay attention to the things that you need to. You probably remember a lot more that way. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. I, I kind of feel like everything we've spoken about here, and I, I guess it goes hand in hand with your work as a psychiatrist. Yeah. It, it all kind of blends into having a positive, happy mental health. How yes. vital is that? Because to harness this creative thinking, yes. you, need, you need to be able to relax, which, is, right. which is difficult uh, if you're struggling with mental health conditions. Yes. And to pay attention can be hard if you're feeling perhaps anxious or if you're depressed. My goodness, you can't you're right. Yep. How vital? Do, do you often feel like perhaps we don't prioritize our mental health as much as maybe we should? A hundred percent. 
thankfully things are changing a little bit. But if we go yeah. back to mind yeah. action profit, uh, and this is neuroeconomically proven over and over again in the studies that we look at, eh, the healthier you are mentally, the more money you will make. <laughs> That's my natural profit. That. It's as simple as that. And um, so we definitely need to prioritize, hey, in the pandemic, I made up an acronym in the shower, believe it or not. It was in the shower. It was in the shower. Using the and alpha this, waves. Yeah. Exact. Now you're talking. Gosh, I'm right? a genius. So I, I came up with what I think is the most helpful well-being framework, at least for me, that I've been teaching all over the world ever since that shower, okay? And I say, look after your swans. It's an acronym that I made up. It's well-being made simple. Will I tell you what it is real quick? Mm -hmm. Number one, look after your sleep. It's a non-negotiable. Number two, the W, hydrate. Look after your water intake. The A is get moving. Uh, you got to look after your activity level. The N is feed your mind well, so look after your nutrition. And that final piece of the puzzle, S, is you got to look after your stress. If you just do those five things, and for those that are listening in, just write this acronym down, stick it on your fridge somewhere where you're going to see it. Like every day, tell the people in your, your team and at home, kids get this too, look after your swan, sleep, water, activity, nutrition, and stress. Five-fold framework for better mental health. Wonderful. I think that's a perfect place to end. Thank you very much for joining me. I've, I've loved that. It's been really, really interesting. I've loved chatting to you, getting to know you. Nice and yeah, one. thanks for joining me. Uh, thanks again for listening. Please do drop us a like and share the episodes if you can. I've been your host, Finley Jack, and I'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.